Welcome, everyone, to the fifth episode of the Baptizing Philosophy podcast. Today, I am here with Eric Orwell uh, from the Airval channel and also from the Understanding Plato channel. That's sort of a, a newer project he's doing. Uh, I, From what I know, from what I've heard uh, from previous videos I've watched, your uh, kind of YouTube mission is to give Plato to the masses, kind of, to... Um, to uh to ed educate people about plato and stuff uh which is cool because i don't know if there's any other channels that i've come across which is, has really um helped me with the details and like the nitty-gritty uh in terms of platonic philosophy because it can get pretty complex and you you have to know how to read him because he's uh he's a unique writer especially um uh, especially coming from a modern perspective so um i guess my first question would just be how did you end up becoming a plate platonist uh and why did you become a platonist like what exactly about platonism uh did you find to be interesting and worth worth pursuing right like a lot of people i started by thinking about the problem of universals and also the ontological status of mathematical objects yeah. um max tegmark was actually influential on me starting to think seriously about mathematical platonism he makes a lot of good arguments um roger penrose also makes good arguments basically unless mathematicals have some kind of independent existence it's very difficult to make a case for objectivity in math and yet clearly math is like phenomenally successful in engineering applications it works in the world like there's clearly clearly a reality to it um so yeah, I, I was a Platonist in a loose sense, like a, I guess a lowercase p Platonist for years when I was first kind of getting into philosophy. And uh, I read Plato early on, you know, just kind of snippets from various dialogues. I had like a Penguin Classics, you know, compilation uh, soft cover book that I went through and I, I always enjoyed it. Um, but I didn't really understand that there was a much more serious philosophical system kind of in the background there. So, um, you know, I started looking more at more modern philosophy. You know, I got interested in Arthur Schopenhauer. Um, I liked Chris Langan's philosophy. And then eventually I decided I would go back. This was around 2015, actually. I would go back and just read all of Plato's dialogues and then go on. My plan was to like read all of Plato and Aristotle. I still have not read all of Aristotle. Uh, if anyone has tried to like read through his organon, it's miserable. It's just, he's such a dense and unclear writer, like in objective terms. And I was reading, so this is a digression, but I was reading like a modern commentary on his prior analytics and he does contradict himself he's not like a totally logical writer himself so he has problems and that's part of uh what leads to people not being able to read him but in any case we're still working through aristotle in my reading groups but uh yeah reading through all of the dialogues i started to kind of understand the nature of the philosophical system there but even then, I still kind of like partly entered into it. And I identified as a, a Platonist, you know, still, but in a loose sense. And I still kind of had my own philosophical views first and, and foremost right. in my mind. And then even later, around 2021, I started these reading groups. We had an initial kind of version of this um, that didn't use the I am Blakean curriculum. So it was kind of like a beta version of what I'm now doing. And uh, that's, I guess I was just old enough to start to really understand it, had enough experience to start to really understand it. And that's when I started thinking like, we really have not progressed pl uh, past Platonism at all. Like he still has the best solutions for most of the major problems in philosophy. Like there was this um, article by J.K. Swindler, who's a contemporary analytical philosopher. And he's looking at the problem of like negative existential reference. So how it's possible to say things about things that don't exist, mm -hmm. you know, because those statements yeah. um, have true properties about them. And yet the referent of the proposition in question 
doesn't exist. So how does that like, work? Like how unicorns, unicorns have horns, like exactly. for example. Okay. Right. Yeah. yeah. And like uh, Bertrand Russell and um, Quine, Willard Quine also um, developed a solution that basically tried to render those propositions as utterly meaningless. Um, J.K. Swindler points out in this article that like that doesn't work for various technical reasons. And he ultimately sides with a, a platonic account, which says that there isn't such a thing as like absolute non-existence. The, the things that we say um, don't exist are simply different from the existence that we have access to in that what we have access to is actual and mm -hmm. those uh, non-existent beings are possible. Um, but that does entail like a realm of possible beings, just like it entails uh, a realm of mathematicals. You know, Platonism right. has a very large ontology. And while that can seem unparsimonious, it ends up providing really convenient and neat solutions for a lot of philosophical problems. Cool. So um, in that um, in that last example, you um, you brought up would what would be the what from a Platonist perspective would be the the defining difference between something that only has possible existence and something that has actual existence? Uh, does it have something to do with um, matter? Because I know that some I've talked to some Platonists and basically they seem to uh, they see matter as the um, I don't even know what the term like, I guess, principle of differentiation and individuation. And I guess in some way that would be linked with actuality, but um, how would how would you see that? Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, the way that Plotinus characterizes matter in the second Ennead fourth tractate, uh, sensible matter is this kind of principle of individuation in that what things here, what bodies have in common are their formal properties and what distinguishes them is like the matter that those formal properties are inhabiting at any given point in time. Um, and I think that's a pretty good concept. Um, matter then in the sensible realm represents this kind of pure potential for actuality. What is actual is always what's formal. Mm -hmm. um, that oh. ultimately leads to a kind of provocio uh, reality <laughs> uh, view of matter itself, where matter doesn't have like a pure existence in the sense that there's no such thing as like just matter completely by itself. Mm -hmm. However, there is a sensible, uh, rather intelligible matter that is like the paradigm the, in the image of which the sensible matter is formed. So there is such a thing as an archetype of matter in a sense, and that's at the very kind of highest levels of the ontological hierarchy with the indefinite dyad, which is a Pythagorean concept, very ancient concept metaphysically that you kind of have the one, right, of course, and then immediately after that, you have the monad, principle of limitation, and the indefinite dyad, principle of kind of energy and um, well, it manifests as potential here as well, but that indefinite dyad is equated with the kind of intelligible matter or the archetype of matter. And there already, you do kind of have this potential actual difference, right? Like the indefinite dyad provides a kind of substrate for the formal principles in the forms themselves, like the realm of forms. Um, just like, you know, sensible matter acts as a substrate for the kind of instantiated formal properties in the, the world of generation. Um, so as far as like the, I'm sorry, can you repeat like the original question about potentials precisely? Um, I, well, I, the, the question was about matter. And then I guess, oh, um, because right. you, I was trying to um, cause you basically said that, um, there for, you mentioned someone like Quine and, and Russell, I think who mm -hmm. had the issue of, they were, they were thinking about potential and how there's a sense in which there's things like a right. unicorn that doesn't, doesn't have actual existence, but, but has potential the, existence. No, so that's the I Platonist would, yeah. solution. Russell and okay. Quine oh. were arguing that the statement is meaningless. That oh, there isn't gotcha. a referendum like yeah. gotcha. Okay. Um, 
So yeah. the platonist solution requires this actual potential uh, mm -hmm. dichotomy. So there's different levels of the actual and the potential. In a certain right. sense, the potential is in the realm of forms. Like the realm of forms yeah, is that's what yeah. pure yeah. act in, in that sense. Um, however, it is, of course, eternal. And so it's not moving from one state to another state in the way mm -hmm. that potential works here. Um, there, like the the substrate principle the indefinite dyad as that material uh, uh, intelligible matter material substrate for the forms is a kind of potential but obviously of a very different sort than sensible uh potential realities and mm -hmm. in the world of generation you'll need a soul to measure that time in order to have the distinction between like what we typically think of as actuality and potentiality so that like the mundane sense of actual and potential that originates with soul. So with the world soul is like the principal soul and then all other souls kind of uh, beneath that level. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so for we, you're kind of presenting this um, ontology where there's like a hierarchy of uh, different, like even a, and there's hierarchies, even seems like there's hierarchies within those hierarchies. But um, I guess the general question about that coming from a Christian perspective, um, and I think this is sort of like a classic Christian critique of Platonism, and it has to do with the way in which these different levels of being uh, interact or commune with the to use Christian language and how does like, for example, I guess, I mean, the fundamental question would be how do we get from the monad to multiplicity like what what exactly um what occurs um in order for the monad to in in a certain sense give rise to multiplicity and be, because from a christian perspective the unity and multiplicity are equally ultimate in in the trinity so we already have a principle of multiplicity in the absolute but it seems like from a platonist perspective the absolute cannot contain multiplicity so where exactly uh, where, where does multiplicity arise from? Right. Well, in the one itself, you don't have a pure simplicity in cataphatic terms. We can't directly predicate simplicity of the one, even though it's called the one. It's called yeah. the one in the sense that that's like the intelligible concept that we can grasp that kind of captures the nature of it the most. Of course, it's the one and the good so there too, there is a kind of multiple aspect quality that this highest thing has. Damascius, a late uh, Neoplatonist, even says that like there is a unity and a multiplicity in the one. So this isn't, you know, foreign to Platonic language. But as far as solving the problem of the one and the many, um, Proclus basically makes the argument that in order for something to be as good as possible, it can't simply be self-perfect, but it has to go beyond that and perfect other things. And so the the highest of all beings, uh, if it's not going to be prolific, won't be like the greatest conceivable being. It won't be as good as it could otherwise be. So to be the best that it can be, the one, the principle of all things has to generate. And it generates first that which is highest and noblest, and doesn't directly create uh, all the levels of beings beyond that. Instead, it creates like the monad, indefinite dyad, as its direct images, the one capturing the oneness of it, the other capturing the power of it, right? Um, then beyond that, you have the henads, which are different aspects of unity. Of course, this is all within um, the first hypostasis. So there's three main levels of being. The hypostases are levels of being, essentially. The first hypostasis, you have the one monad, indefinite dyad, and then the henads, which Iamblichus probably introduced. Um, uh, although I would argue that it is there in Plato, even the um, metaphor of the cave, I think there is a, a reference indirectly to the idea of the henads, but that's a we, that would be a sidetrack, so let's not... Um, but the henads are aspects of unity that cor sort of correspond to each of the individual forms. Um, sort of like the case of the form, you know, that oneness that a particular thing has in a unique way. So the one generates all of that 
more or less directly. And then the top of the next level of being will kind of be being, strictly speaking, usia itself, the principle of essence. Everything in the first hypostasis is super essential in that what an essence is, is like an eternal nature that is defined, that like characterizes some particular thing. Mm -hmm. Things in the first hypostasis are beyond essential predication. They're beyond that intelligible principle. They have unity and they have goodness, but they're not, they're supra uh, inte uh, intelligible beings. So uh, so then you have Usia in this new class of beings and you have kind of a new act of creation. At each level, like a thing perfects itself and then goes on to begin perfecting other things and generating right. other things. I mean, that even applies in the world of generation itself. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I, I didn't know any of that, but I think that's, um, yeah, that helps to clarify a lot because there are a lot of uh, overlaps here with Christianity. But I would say that... Um, just off the top of my head, what seems to be the main difference, and I'm kind of just wondering what your general take is on 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 the Trinity, because I think that would be the the difference that we agree that there's a sense in which to be perfect, um, you cannot be perfect in just alone. Like you can't be. Uh, that's not the fullness of perfection because perfection involves a sharing, uh, like a love, a almost like a dynamic reality, and. Uh, for us, uh, God himself as Trinity is this perfect uh, unity and multiplicity. He in himself, um, the father generates the son and inspires the spirit. And then there's this communion of love. So already in, in God himself, there is this, um, this self-giving. There is this unity of, of uh, identity and, and difference because there is a unity there is an identity in the difference there the the three persons of the trinity are fully um are fully mutually interior to one another so yeah. i would just wonder um like what what would be your reason for rejecting this understanding of the the absolute like th this is kind of the equivalent of the one for us uh even though we would say following um pseudo Dionysius and and uh, others that the essence of God what God is is incomprehensible but who God is this has been revealed to us as Trinity so um just wrap my point up the you um when you're talking about how the one uh gives uh generates for lack of a more precise term generates uh multiplicity um below it um it's almost like it the one <sighs> It, the one isn't complete in itself so it requires something um it there's almost like a necessity of creation problem here that um i we don't like traditionally we haven't uh fallen into that because god is already perfect in his trinitarian communion he already meets the criteria of of um inner perfection in and through his uh sacrificial perfection which you were talking about so that already occurs in god instead of it having the one and then the one having to uh generate lower levels of of being uh so what what's your general take on on the trinity and why um like i know you call yourself a christian but you're not a a trinitarian so you you actually wouldn't meet the criteria of a, a christian according to the to the orthodox church but um but you clearly see something in, in christ and there definitely are overlaps like i've talked with other platonists and they kind of gave a different picture of uh, than what you were talking about like i've never heard about this uh perfection needing to go beyond itself to perfect others so uh yeah yeah what's your view on the trinity right uh well i mean the three persons of the trinity the, the greek language there is hypostasis hypostasis yeah so many people in late antiquity associated the three hypostases that Plotinus talks about with the three persons of the Trinity. And there's a school of thought that that is the original sense of the term hypostasis in the Christian tradition, and that it became more of a, a personalistic concept later. I don't know the historical veracity of that for sure. I don't think but so. Yeah, I don't think so because of the Cappadocian fathers who kind of they're the ones who really developed this and they're they're fourth fourth century. So um I I think Christians have been personalists for for since the beginning. Personally. Why do they use the term hypostasis? Um the actually 
I would, if you want to look into this, you can find a PDF of John Zazulis's book, Being as Communion, online. The first chapter, he talks about the development of the term, um, both the term uh, prosopone, which is person uh, or mask in, in Greek theater, and then mm -hmm. how we... Uh, how hypostasis came came around and his whole argument is that before um, the Cappadocian fathers especially but I mean the Christians in particular uh, the uh, or Christians in general the uh, notion of person never had like there never was this absolute value to the person like uh, for like prosopon uh, meant mask in 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 Greek so there was like this idea right. that there was uh like there wasn't like an absolute value there's something like uh, fake about it um something inauthentic but uh yeah yeah, yeah so, like for the yeah. mystery religions probably personhood was something to be overcome right you know and, and do you and, take that position in you the do, sense right? i mean there are different senses of personhood so i guess to answer that i'd have to get at why did they start using the term hypostasis and what is the difference between the original uh you know, mask concept of personhood and this other concept. Because I don't know if that's there in the Greek literature otherwise using hypostasis to mean this term person. So yeah, if um, you could just explain that historically, why did they start using hypostasis and what's the what's the definitional change there that happened? Well, I think, well, hypostasis wasn't used to refer to mask. I'm, I'm pretty sure. No. Right, hypostasis kind of meant hypostasis and from my understanding hypostasis and usia were basically used synonymously um I, i've heard so that similar like, yeah similar right so it wasn't i don't think it was really until the nicene council where there was that like the 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 distinction between usia and hypostasis and hypostasis referred to person and i think i'm not exactly sure like i i I'm not uh, that well read on the history of it, but I'm not exactly sure why they ended up using the term hypostasis and and defining it the way they it, did. It's but just I... weird because it's exactly in that time period they started using this term when it was a technical term within Platonism. Also, mm -hmm. a lot of the Christians during that time were Platonists, like bishops yeah. studied Neoplatonism. Yeah. And even like one of them, I forget the name, I was just looking into this guy. He like said, okay, I'll be a bishop in the church, but I still believe in the eternity of the world, the created world, that is, and, and various other like Neoplatonic doctrines. So okay. the, the fact that the traditions were so tightly enmeshed, um, and then they use this Neoplatonic technical term in a in a Neoplatonic, uh, well, actually, it's not quite the Neoplatonic sense. Uh, anyway, uh, it's the history there, I think, is very ambiguous. Yeah. And in any case, if there was an influence from Neoplatonism onto Christianity regarding the notion of the three hypostases, the three persons, then it would basically mean that the one has a counterpart in the intelligible, that is usia being itself, the principle, the, the kind of form of forms within the realm of forms. Sometimes the one is called like the form of forms, uh, there's a lack of like clarity in the technical language here because we're speaking English and not Greek. Yeah. Um, but basically the, the correspondence is the one would be like the role of the father, more or less. Mm -hmm. The principal form in the realm of forms would be like the logos would be like the sun. Yeah. And then the world soul would be like the Holy Spirit. And the, it doesn't line up perfectly because the world soul is suke and spirit is pneuma. And there's like, that's a marked dif uh, difference in the New Testament, you know, to kind of let go of the suke and em embrace the pneuma more or less. Um, but uh, there, there's also the pneuma within Platonism as well. And so there would, within like the pneumatic realm, there would be a principal member. This is the notion of the, the Sarai divine series, where from the one, there's a, a row kind of moving straight down through the hierarchies that is the most principally divine, right? The, the truest embodiment of, uh, of the one at each level. Um, that same thing would apply to the other aspects of unity as well though so you would have not just father son to use the christian language and um and spirit in that column but you would have like the the aspect of unity that is that of the guardian 
like kind of like like the athena imagery you know that which guards and unites in that sense and then you would have the corresponding notion of guardianship in the realm of forms and a corresponding like guardian soul that actually acts in the world to affect this at its own level so i think um the hypostases and the the notion of the divine sarai map fairly well onto the christian notion of the trinity because like the the godhead is not restricted to the first hypostasis in a certain sense because we do identify the manifestations of a particular divine uh, series here with its ultimate source like proclus talks about in the myths in the greek myths when we have an apparition of Zeus. Zeus comes here and does something. It's not the henatic Zeus, like the, the principal Zeus that actually manifests in the world and does things. It's more like a, a daimonical apparition or a spirit that itself is in that divine series. So what we make contact with, I mean, it's also sort of similar to the essence energy distinction. You're not making contact with the essence of Zeus for Proclus. It's a, a generated being, which is distinct from the, you know, the energies of God are not generated, of course, in orthodoxy. And maybe this term, again, it's an English technical term that might not map perfectly onto what Proclus would have meant, but... Um, in any case, it is something in the series of that Hanatic Zeus that we actually make contact with. Right. So I, I have no problem with the Trinitarian language. I mean, I think of the Father basically in the image of the One, the the Son as that kind of presiding principle of order of the cosmos, not restricted to the cosmos, you know, transcending, but also indwelling in the cosmos. And then uh, the Holy Spirit, I mean, it does make sense to me that there would be this like, because there are different spiritual motions, of course, and one is going to be in that principal divine series that like deserves the most honor, respect, worship, and should be followed, right? So I, I you know, I have no problem with the Trinitarian, the, the problem is for me that like the technical Orthodox or Catholic language around the Trinity um <laughs> is like non-philosophical and so ultimately like it's just a bunch of to my mind to my perspective it's just a bunch of words because the catholic church will like say you know you have to believe this this and this about the trinity these uh uh particular predicates but like the, you can't define them you're saying it's beyond human reason so like what exactly am i even believing um so i don't know i i don't know whether you know i could be called a trinitarian fairly or not yeah. But that's kind of, yeah. well, and then the, the personhood notion, I'm still interested yeah, in like yeah. exactly what's meant by hypostasis yeah. in the Orthodox church and Catholicism for that matter. Right. Um, well, for, for us, um, there is a certain sense in which you can't, you can't define a person in, in intellectual terms. And I think this has to do with, with uh, this kind of has to do with our rejection of, of, uh, certain i would say platonist influence influence notions of the beat, beatific vision and by us i mean the orthodox um because there's a certain sense in which um it it doesn't it transcends unity with god transcends the intellect precisely because he's a person so what you know of god is him as a person so it's like a personal encounter between god, uh, us and god and for us there's a certain irreducibility of a personal encounter in the same way there's an irreducibility of the person to anything that you could point out like like for example in your in your debate with jay uh, a few years back you were talking about how you were um influenced a lot by tegmark uh, and you were an information reductionist i don't know if you still are but um then jay asked you well we're persons and we're talking to each other so what would a how would you fit in uh the person within the the an information theory of reality and i mean i would have the same question because for me there the problem with um the notion of personhood and why it's difficult is i think there you can't des describe it because you can't circumscribe what a person is you can't like you can't right. get you can't like have a because a person is absolute image of god eternal we're 
But right. so what you can't do is define and circumscribe a person. But what you can do is experience the person through yeah. per, a personal relationship. Um, so Actually, I actually do have an answer yeah. to that now. So okay, sure. Um, so basically, I'm an information reductionalist in physics, but physics is not the ultimate reality. That's in the world of generation. Right. So if hypostasis is taken to be that substrate of existence, then for things here, the soul, like the hyparxis or summit of the soul is in that hypostasis of soul. Um, so if that's the sense of personality transcending information, I have no problem with that. You know, the, the principle of the soul, what gives the soul its unity is beyond information but that's because soul is beyond the generated world you know so the physical world may reduce to information but that doesn't mean that levels beyond physics don't actually come down and uh influence things here sure and so where would you fit the person like because for us um like me as a like to use kind of, I guess, psychological language, like me as an ego, like a person, a center of consciousness in Christianity, I will continue to exist eternally. Like I was created. Right. And then because God is perfect in himself and for us, um, God is like, and I, you say this too about the one, like God is beyond eternity. God is super essential. Right. So mm -hmm. eternity, um, eternity for us is, um, uh, well, time for us is, uh, uh and i remember jay like in your debate he was like oh time the philosophy uh theology of time is really difficult in orthodoxy and actually it, it is kind of hard to explain to people who aren't familiar with it but um there god is in eternity he created us into time like the heavens were created perfect um and then earth the the world with formless and void and the purpose um of uh of God's plan for creation is to unite the heavens with the earth. And then that is the, the, um, that is the eschaton. That's us entering into eternity. And eternity is a um, personal relationship with God, a direct experience with God, because time for us is the interval of waiting between acts of love. So, um, and by love, we just mean like procession and reversion towards like movement towards the other and the others return back. God is eternal because the father, son, there's no distance in the relationship of love between the father, son, and Holy spirit. They're perfectly mutually, uh, mutually interior. So we're meant to become by grace deified, which is to say we enter into the Trinitarian communion, not by, by nature, but by grace, and we are deified. Mm -hmm. um, so in that sense, us as persons will remain into in eternity. We will enter in this into this communion and we will remain eyes like concrete, distinct individual persons, but will be united mm -hmm. fully with God and with others in the sense of full mutual interiority where um yeah, there's essentially this perfect, dis uh, no, no more distance, a perfect unity between people while remaining distinct. So this is like a classic, like unity and distinction, um, mm -hmm. unity and distinction idea that, uh, that we affirm. So where for you is, where does the person begin? Like, it, cause, uh, like you said, uh, the person can't be reduced to information, but where exactly does it begin? And I guess like my, another question would be like the one can't be personal like i guess you can't believe in a god with a face can you like you can't believe in a god who has a a personality and is a person in the sense that we could talk to like you we could pray like we can pray to god who is the one for us but i don't know if you would be praying to the one if that even makes sense since i don't think the person the notion of person would apply at that level of reality yeah i think again we're dealing with this ambiguity about the concept of the hypostasis. The terms that you use to describe personality, like an ego or like a center of consciousness, mm -hmm. in Carl Jung's sense, he would define that as the self and the persona he would use more in that sense of the mask, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, as you're describing it, it seems like you're talking about the kind of self with the capital S exactly as Carl Jung uses it. Um, so, I mean, if that's the case, you know, ultimately I do tend still towards a kind of 
uh, Advaita Vedanta perspective here kind of at the highest level, but mm -hmm. there's some subtlety here because I do think there's an eternal existence of souls and souls are distinct. So right. I don't think that the soul blends into the one and dissipates. But at the same time, um, the the hyparxis of the soul goes... So, so before I said it was kind of rooted in the uh, hypostasis of soul, that's oversimplifying it. Ultimately, like the the extreme summit of the soul reaches into the realm of uh, intellect, nous. That's why we have intellects, right? Because that the soul is suspended from the realm of um, forms, ultimately. And obviously those forms, like if you keep zooming in to the summit of the soul and what is most, like what is closest to the center of our being and identity, first we go, well, we're, the soul is us sort of basically. And then like within us, the we are grounded in intelligible principles, our intellect, which is the summit of our own being as our soul. But then within that, like you keep going to the summit of intellect and eventually you get back, you have to get back to the one, which grants the unity for all things. Mm -hmm. And so what makes the the intellect in us one, what, make, what gives it reality fundamentally? It is the one. And yet, qua it's uh, our participation in it as our particular soul, we are in kind of a particular um, henatic series. We we are making contact with a particular aspect of unity. But even there still, there is this kind of, uh, if you go beyond that still, uh, everything terminates back in the one. But it's problematic to, to talk about the one in uh, relational terms insofar as the one like at its summit is kind of, transcendent of relationship with as uh like via without i don't know how to put this exactly but um the one like it, you can't say that there's here's the one and here's all other things right. and there are these fixed and definite relationships that persist for all time because then the one is not absolute the one is not like ultimate in some sense because it's definition of like what what it is and where it is is contextual it has to do with where all of these other beings are that it relates to from like the one's perspective there isn't anything but it and yet from our perspective there is this distinction between like the summit of our being as one transcendent in a and in a sense other than us insofar as we're in that relation with it but like for the one sort of like for god all things are good type deal like for the one there is only what's already within it and there is this principle in platonism and it, you know made explicit by proclus that there's causal containment where everything that's real in lower levels is there seminally and causally in the higher level so the one contains the multiplicity of all real beings in some sense. Mm -hmm. And so then contains like us individually, which does look like this mutual communion. I mean, as right. far as I can tell, Orthodox theology was derived from ne Neoplatonism. I mean, <laughs> that's kind of how it looks to me. And I do see these similarities now as I've learned more about Neoplatonism and more about Orthodoxy since that encounter with Jay. Um, but yeah. So, I mean, did that kind of answer? Yeah. The no. I want, sorry. I want to qualify one more thing. Sure. So uh, this is not explicit in Neoplatonism or in Plato himself. There are only hints at the idea, but the question is whether like in our cycle of reincarnation, which Platonists do believe in, whether we are kind of consigned to always identify with our particular soul, or in some sense, if we can transcend time as our self, as our center of identification, like what are we fundamentally identifying with? Is it possible to kind of transcend out of the realm of soul through intellect all the way back to the one? Can we return to the one fully? This kind of henosis idea where we we would no longer be, like I wouldn't be any more Eric than you are Trey, like at that point. We would, okay. I would if full on henosis took place, it would be kind of all of these identities would be brought into a, a total unity. Although again, not a cataphatically simple thing, 
but unity as far as you know what the excellences that we see in unified things here that to like the asymptotic extension of the concept beyond our you know ability to actually uh you know make it intellectually clear <laughs> right right so but anyway but that's really not clear and proclus even seems to indicate that like you are kind of fatalistically consigned always to mm-hmm. cycle in this particular soul and i would make sense of that by saying like the the existence of the soul as one thing in reality like that will cycle forever no matter what but like is that really the self is that who you really are? In the first Alcibiades, Plato uses some language in, in the voice of Socrates that's a little ambiguous, but he basically like distinguishes between ourselves as the soul. And he goes, he hints beyond that and says, like, are we even the soul or are we the the itself itself or something, something along that line, it's reminiscent of like, I am that I am, you know? So that's that's not clear whether they're, you know, Neoplatonists could accept the full on henosis, like absolute unity with the one as far as that's conceivable, or if uh, more of a theosis similar to right. the orthodox concept is, is truer. Um, right. Again, I still lean towards the Advaita Vedanta okay. um, henosis concept. Right. Um, I mean, the last thing I'll say about that, like I know, um, like if I were to ask you to, to describe it, in cataphatic terms, like as you were saying, like it's not really, really possible. Um, but like to me, it seems like the both of these are distinct from theosis because with what you were talking about, uh, the the position you lean to, it seems like there has to be, like, like there has to be some sort of sacrifice of your own personal distinctiveness. While for theosis, you remain distinct while God becomes fully, like he indwells in you, like the incarnation idea, the uh, God indwells um, in, in on the earth. He tabernacles among us. Right. He perfectly unites himself to the world. But um, you, the, you lose all your negative qualities, right? Right. Yes. You lose all, like all, yeah. all your, the consequences of sin, right? Like you lose your fallen, you lose the incompletion we are born into the world in time. We enter into eternity. Um, but that, like for us, individuality is not the product of the fall, nor is it something that's going to be dispensed with. We were made like uh, male and female. And only then, actually, if you read the the, the, the Bible, typically like uh, I know Augustine and others identified the image of God with uh, the possession of uh, rationality, which I don't think is, is wrong necessarily. But from the biblical perspective, uh, image of God is referred to mankind as a whole after Eve is already made. So the image of God is hu- the human family as a unity in distinction as male and female. Um, and at also um, with the implication of children, because God says, be fruitful and multiply. So um, like for us, there is no uh, loss of your individuality, like your right. be- because that would kind of, from my perspective, that would kind of negate theosis as a whole, because you're you're not there to experience your deification. And then with the other one you were talking about, which which you were saying, and I, I think you're right, it's closer to theosis, but it seems like because it cannot be a unity with the absolute, like it, it kind of has to remain within a lower order of being. So that wouldn't be, how could that be perfection then? And I know you lean more towards the other idea, but it, mm-hmm. it with the other one, it seems like, like I and I know, like you're saying that souls are eternal and stuff, but um, but yeah, yeah, let's get more into well, that. Well, here's because... here's a problem I see with this teleologically, um, because I do think, given the kind of technical language that I was talking about around causal containment, the one already has all of the good attributes that I have. Everything that's good in me is right. there in the one. So right. if that's my individuality, then I don't lose it. But there isn't an exclusive identification with it as compared to, like I said, I'm no more me than I am you at that point. I would also have all of your good qualities. So like teleologically, we, to, to accept that individuality entails like a, a kind of exclusive identification with this particular set of goods, then it seems then that we can't ever fulfill as much good as is possible and god would therefore like assign to us an imperfect uh state of of being in eternity 
instead of perfecting absolutely and instead of just identification uh, identification with a particular set of good properties instead you would identify with the whole not right. losing that okay. identity that you're you are because it's causally contained in the one right but right. then you go beyond theosis as defined in orthodoxy i would think well um i mean when you're talking about I wouldn't accept that I wouldn't accept that qualities like you were talking about individuality and qualities like I would take a more um I mean just a more personalist view of what individuality is like I don't think we are reducible to our qualities I think I mean uh St Gregory of Nyssa uh one of the early uh fourth fourth century Cappadocians he talks about how there's in essence energy energy distinction within humans as well there is uh mm -hmm. there is us qua us right as we are and then there is our qualities and or our energy our, our activities so i don't think we can reduce the person to qualities so in terms of like just the way i would understand theosis you have multiple absolute eyes like saint augustine has this famous quote where he says god loves every person as if they were the only persons he created um and i think this gets to the idea that every single person is an absolute eternal being created to be eternal um their individuality is good and meant to be preserved into eternity. And the way there is the unity is that um, instead of having this distance between minds now, like uh, there, there is a um, like, there, yeah, there's just a distance between people. And then within that space, because of our lack of communion, there is that space for lying, for rebelling, for, for, mm -hmm. for self will and all this stuff. Um, this is um that's the fallen world and then theosis is becoming united together everyone united together in in christ in the logos so everyone maintains their individual eyes even though i think there would be like a sharing of of qualities of, of properties like energies is right. where communion communion takes place at an energetic level and then it's through my activities like it's through me talking and stuff that you know me uh right now and you're experiencing me and that would be my energies but then i still remain a distinct person and then you just take this to its fullest conclusion where you're fully experiencing me i'm fully experiencing you yet we remain distinct eyes like distinct right. individualities i probably quality wasn't the best term to use property would be closer to what i was getting at because in like there has to be a term that captures like attributes of essence even if we're not talking about qualities like what what distinguishes one essence from another whatever those distinguishing things are that's kind of what i was getting at instead of sure. quality you know strictly speaking sure. um but i think the point still holds though that teleologically if it's good to be the essence that you are and it's good to be for the uh, for another person to be the essence that they are i mean seemingly in a kind of simplistic logic it would be better to have both essential natures together instead of only being one to the exclusion of the other right but for us we um like we I, I'm not exactly sure how, you, how you're using essence here, but for us, there's one essence, like humans share one essence. And then what distinguishes us is our person. So, um, per, personhood oh, okay. so is, wait, yeah. wait, yeah, yeah. That's confusing then. Um, yeah. so peep individual human beings don't have individual essences at all. Then, uh, in orthodoxy? No, but no, because, um, we are particular, um, like hypostasis in the language of especially St. Maximus the Confessor, who I think you'd mm -hmm. love if you haven't read him. Uh, he says that the uh, uh, hypostasis en hypostasizes, so particularizes, instantiates an essence, like make like and there is no for us like we're not platonist like we're almost closer to aristotle aristotle in the sense um and in the sense that um for us there is no essence without hypostasis there is no essence prior to or before the the determinate um like actual um uh manifestation of the essence in a particular thing in a hypostasis well, then that, yeah. that see, doesn't seem to make sense because before creation god already had the logoi of the, logi, the, the human logi, yeah. essence yeah but the logi had... logi aren't our essence logi is not essence for us okay but god in his divine knowledge already contained 
all of the essences he was going to generate, right? Like, yeah. it's not like he added them when he actually created, as if it was another point in time. I guess, okay. Um, so the rank order of hypostasis, usia, and how self-substantial these are is pretty confusing uh, as you're describing it. Because uh, hypostases, persons, are created and so aren't self-substantial. Um, and the usia, too, is, well, it must be created. And um, and yet, like, in plain, the language of usia would indicate an eternal form. Right. And I would, you know, equate, like, those forms as knowledge in the mind of God. And even right. Aristotle would have all of the usias as thoughts in the mind of God, and there's no distinction there. I think people, like, really misunderstand hylomorphism, and it, I don't think Aristotle held that forms don't exist prior to particular instantiation of things. Okay. Um, but anyway, uh, so yeah, I mean, I'm still... Not, not clear on how these concepts rank and why and where's the logic for that but like going back to the the teleological issue okay my the point is whatever i exclusively am in the uh you know blessed condition in after salvation uh is completed you know in theosis what i exclusively am I can understand there's a, a communication with all the other things in terms of energy, but my essence then is still kind of like mine only, and I don't have the essences of other things. Um, it would seem that if the essences of other things are good for them, then the, the sum total of all of these essences together would have to be better than any one of them in isolation. So you remain isolated in some sense. And I wonder what's the teleological justification for that? Not, I mean, I am kind of questioning the motives of God according to orthodoxy here, but why does God like aim for a salvation for us in which we remain separate at some, at the essential level okay. from right. all other souls? Well, I like we, uh, oh, I would shoot, just say sorry, that, I forgot Ess essence is yeah. shared in humanity. So I'm still confused. Why it, just it would just, I mean, just persons. Again. We're different. We're different as persons, right? So, I mean, right. like we remain individual eyes. And I think the reason why is because God created us as God is personal and he is complete in himself because I, I agree 100% with you that true perfection is involves a, um, a perfecting of others. So it involves like uh like the eucharist there's a notion of like a gift giving right so like god gives himself to us we give him back to god and this is all based on the trinity where there is like an eternal gift giving where the the father gives himself to the son and then he sees himself in the son through the spirit and the spirit uh the the son gives himself back through the spirit to him and then through this um this and this doesn't occur in time obviously this is logical but they're always already united perfectly in one another so there's mm -hmm. this tri-personal communion so being perfect in himself containing everything all every all essences all all the logi and the logi are not our essences because human at the human nature like human essence was created right logi are eternal and logi are the patterns and the divine archetypes that like the blueprints that so there's a blueprint in a notion of the um of human nature in the mind of god and mm -hmm. and yeah that's that's the logi and the logi are both distinct from creation and distinct from the essence of god like who god is so the logi are basically within the same like some people identify them absolutely with the divine energies some people want to say the divine energies are more so um like god god interacting with creation but like the the you know in polymite theology at least the energies are eternal like the energies are uh mm -hmm. maximus talks about the rays or the glory surrounding the essence that uh eternally uh manifests from the essence shines forth like the rays of the sun um so there is i the, wonder if that term is sarai by the way just for the neoplatonic I, orthodox history i, I wouldn't I, yeah i wouldn't yeah. doubt it um yeah right. i wouldn't doubt it so uh 
yeah so so basically our goal at god as a person created something genuinely other than himself because he's complete in himself he is able to create and this is um the our doctrine of kenosis or self-limitation where there is a real parallel between god's creation and uh christ's uh sacrifice on the cross and maximus makes a a, a link between christ's sacrifice and uh creation because God as complete in himself has the ability to self-limit and posit something, create out of nothing, ex nihilo, something genuinely other than him. And mm. as genuinely, this genuinely other being is his image, right? So a person, and as a person, we are meant to, ret uh, we are meant to um, be united uh, uh, with God by grace, like through his activities, through his love, the grace that he pours out, we are meant to synergize our wills with the will of God that he reveals through his grace and enter into eternity. And eternity is precisely defined as a personal communion with God. So the reason why it's teleologically, it would be justified that we remain distinct persons and we don't, we don't, aren't reduced to just something higher to get is because if that were to occur, we would lose our individual individuality. We would lose no, our personhood. Okay, but instead of saying it blends into something higher, why couldn't it be instead that I am my individual person, but right. also all the other individual people? Like, mm -hmm. why can't you have all of these identities instead I, of just one? I think there's a sense in which that does occur. Like, like we, like we, we are not another person, but we have that other person like we have christ we we have them interior to us but they there remains remains that distinction there because i just don't think that it's like i just don't think it's it's logically it logically makes sense that you could be yourself and also be another because like these are two absolutes right each individual is is absolute like like image of god and if they were to become each other i think that would have to result in the negation of of their distinctness so i think what christian what orthodoxy is trying to get at is how do we get a perfection of unity while remaining uh while remaining distinct and i think that from our perspective it, it just doesn't really make sense on a logical basis that you could be someone else but also be you like how would you explain that philosophically how would you justify the idea of being someone well, else and you it would blend into the henosis concept in the sense that if the hypostasis is the self with a capital s of carl Jung, um which it sounded like then that is there causally contained in the one already and so if you had that identification with the highest aspect of yourself that would place you in an identity with the one because your first being in a sense would be causally contained in the one already so if you had made it there all the way gone as close to uh the first principle as possible then there would no longer be a distinction uh there would be a distinction but you wouldn't exclusively be your hypostasis to use it in your sense as i think you're using it right instead like you would kind of because that's there all that's good all that's real in your personal identity is there already contained in the one but once you got to that level you you wouldn't be making the discriminating identification act you wouldn't be like saying this and not this it would just be uh <laughs> the the simple i am containing all of the goodnesses that come from all individual things and that would be i mean it makes sense with the kind of procession reversion idea in uh procline theology where you have a movement away procession from the one that is creative that multiplies that creates these distinctions and then you have a reversion of all of these things back to their source and because there is this cycle um, it's it, it's a sort of it's a way of baking the having already created stuff um, process into the abiding or fundamental nature of the higher thing. So the one um, processes 
it, it abides, processes, and reverts. Everything that proceeded from the one reverts to the one, ultimately. Everything real, obviously not the evil stuff. The evil is going to be kind of a, a matter of perspective. To God, nothing will be bad, only for particular souls. And Pro, uh, Proclus like, identifies exactly what level of soul evil first appears. And, uh, and it doesn't have an ultimate reality. Only for those souls and things beneath them does evil have a reality. But in any case... Um, the the multiplicity goes back to the one and kind of in that sense like fills out the abiding nature but because this isn't a sequence of steps it's an eternal cycle sort of like the the trinity is an eternal communion right um right. then uh there isn't this kind of problem that you mentioned earlier where mm -hmm. like you know why does the one have to create if in order to be good well the creative act is there already kind of baked in essentially right. anyway because this abiding proceeding reverting cycle is intrinsic to the uh the one itself gotcha gotcha okay yeah that yeah that helps a lot because i and i think like uh that that was kind of just my goal with the talk uh just to clearly define our our differences here and i think we're getting to it because for for me uh and from an orthodox perspective god is complete in himself like everything you were talking about with like the sort of the creative necessity like obviously we don't see say christ or the, the son and the spirit are created but this um this movement beyond oneself that uh i agree is necessary for true perfection that is already in the trinity and then also all the logi all the ideas for individual beings and their natures their essences are in uh in uh in god as an as an idea as a thought and then creation mm -hmm. is creation is genuinely something other than god but because it is the because every created being is from god receives its being entirely from god so is entirely contingent and is um in a certain sense has a lesser being than than god in in the sense that without god there would not be another like like there's a three hypostases that are necessary uh and then there are other hypostases that are completely contingent and by right. i just mean other persons like created beings yeah. and these are completely contingent so um they don't have to like there is no necessity that these things return to the one like they're like that and that has to do with our understanding of free will and the genuine mm -hmm. otherness outside of god there is a um it, it is up to to us to synergize our wills with god because in order to have a personal communion with someone like even just me and you it, there has to be our free will involved like i need to consent mm -hmm. to talk with you and then i need to actually do it i need to participate so we believe that in, in the same way that we're downstream from god in in the created or like uh, not the created order but um in terms of him being eternal us being created him being necessary us being contingent in the same way we receive grace from god and that is like the the primary cause of our ability like that energy that we receive the grace we receive is what we use to synergize our wills like we couldn't do that without his will but also we you also need the synergy of the will to return back to god and that's why mm -hmm. we believe in stuff like um like eternal damnation like eternal damnation is possible because we are truly created outside of god he genuinely out of nothing creates something outside himself because he's perfect in himself so it doesn't really matter like ontologically what happens to creation um god as a personal loving being obviously cares and draws everyone to himself calls us all back to him but ontologically speaking we could all uh we could all uh reject god and be damned and that wouldn't have an effect on god's on god's nature because he's complete in the trinitarian communion so i think mm -hmm. Uh, the difference here is that you, from a monistic perspective, you would want to show how ultimately every single thing, uh, every distinction, which, um, or I guess there, it's illusory from the perspective of the one, but are real distinctions, like at yeah. their level of being, yeah. they ultimately need to return back to the one as their essence. And then, but for us, we would say an, uh, our essence is genuinely other than God's, uh, is genuinely other than the one. And um, and for that reason, we have freedom and the ability to return to God or to uh, lose ourselves. Um, so, yeah, 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 yeah the, the concept uh, Usia essence is clearly different as we're yes, talking about. Yes, it. for sure. So I would say there are Usias 
that are distinct from the one. And it's not that all things have one essence in the one. Sure. It, uh, they have their own, just like I, as an individual have my own essence that's distinct from yours. But at the same time, there is a human nature that both of us share in, and there is the essence of human nature. So we have that essence of human nature. We also have our particular essences. So that it's a slightly different concept. Um, but so the, the problem here with free will has to do actually with the same ambiguity in the ultimate self-identity that I mentioned in Plato himself and in the Neoplatonists. So we, we clearly have our soul. Our soul is one eternal structure. Our, the, the soul has its essence in eternity and its energy in time in Platonism. So like my, the essence of my soul is it, it has an eternal existence no matter what, and yet it's not the one itself. It is right. something, it, it, in a sense, it has a necessary role in the whole of things, but it was, it, I mean, you could call it created. You could call it generated. It is in the image of the one. It's not the one itself as that essence. But mm -hmm. as I was saying, I don't know that the self-identity is ultimately restricted to the essence of my particular soul. Um, and, you know, the, at one level, in Platonism, you can say there are all these hierarchical levels that have that necessarily must be, and yet they are kind of generated from the one, and they they do have a necessary reversion. But if these are all roles in the hierarchical system that we occupy, but we but aren't us fundamentally, then we as individual, like the real identity that we are, could potentially move down indefinitely and lead to an eternal damnation or move up all the way to full henosis. Um, so it just depends on where you situate this fundamental identity. But as far as like the necessity of creation, that does, I think, amount to a real distinction. Because um, also one other uh, like qualification here these roles may have like a necessary sense of generation. They may like be necessary beings. Um, but uh, the, the individual path through them may be like indefinitely multiplied. Like you might take an infinite number of paths in the same sense that like, you know, there's one map, but you can navigate it in an infinite variety of ways. So in that sense, we may be, may be dealing with like the, the freedom realm, which is like kind of infinitely more vast than the necessary hierarchical structure that is uh, defined intrinsically. But anyway, so that's, I think, where the real difference lies. It's that all of the forms, I think, are necessary, and yet they're images. All souls are necessary is a logical consequence of the forms being necessary because okay. what defines a particular soul is the kind of temporal way in which it shifts between the different forms. So it, it's sort of like, um, you know, if you admit that a certain set of mathematical principles are like real, then immediately all of their consequences have to be real too. You can't say only the principles have a necessary existence, not the consequences. Once you define the principles, immediately the consequences follow. So in the same way, if the forms are necessary, then all the souls, which amount to all the kind of paths through the forms to oversimplify it, um, are necessary too. And that would be the last of the necessary beings. Usias mm -hmm. are necessary. So souls, forms, and of course, everything in the first hypostasis as well would be necessary and yet created in a sense. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I agree. That would be like a, that would be a, a distinction. And uh, I mean, one, one thing I've been wanting to ask uh, someone who takes a monistic uh, view of uh, view of reality um, is when it comes to like you, you talk about how everything is implicit implicitly or seminally contained within the higher orders of being right so mm -hmm. and then the one contains everything um my question would just be like how are we conceiving of how are you conceiving of the one and like how does multiplicity 
like, is there an internal multiplicity to the one? Or is it like, you're going to take the apathetic approach to this? Like, we can't even speak of it. And like, because for me, um, and, and I was kind of assuming, because yeah. I've, I've heard that the one is like a pure, like a divine simplicity, like in a Thomistic sense. And my problem with this is that when you're understanding a, when you're talking about a simple thing, like absolutely simple in the sense of a perfect, almost like a perfect self-relation from my, like, something that orthodox theology especially recently uh, especially in the past like century has really emphasized is that self relation is almost like a concept that's foreign to our um ontology because god isn't a self relation god is a trinity humans aren't self relations because we are entirely contingent upon god so god gives us to us and that gives uh, our being to us and then we're meant to respond to, to him so like being is this dialogue this like the fullness of existence is the communion the dialogue with god so there's always a self transcendence as opposed to a, a self relation so um how are how do you conceive uh multiplicity in the one is it something you can't even can't even think or and why why yeah this is what i'm wondering mm -hmm. why on the basis of the one do we have to have the the other hypostases or are you going mm -hmm. from the lower level and then deducing the one from that or do you think you can go both ways or or yeah well yeah the dialectical process would be moving from particulars right. up ultimately to the one sure. and then back down so both forms of motion are possible um but no i i don't conceive of the one in strict terms like a conception of it is impossible right. um and and yet like we kind of circulate around these higher uh um you know apophatically predicated what's the term i'm looking for ineffable uh levels of reality we have mm -hmm. to kind of circumambulate them and know them by their their consequence in lower levels of being so like if we know one of the forms which i do think it's possible to have knowledge of although not a concept of, we don't have a, a concept of each of the forms the concept would be like the term noema and that's uh at more of like a dianoetic level which is kind of the level of soul itself like the thought process discursive reasoning and relational definitions that's it like that soul level of what we are but then the intellect is a more right. unitive yeah. mental mental process i mean it's inadequate it, to call it a process well, what is even, what but... is the intellect what is is the intellect because the intellect can't be reduced to like rational comprehension of concepts and thinking mm -hmm. of concepts right. but what exactly it what exactly is it it's what allows for the rational comprehension of concepts it's uh i mean they use metaphors the neoplatonists use metaphors to get at it so like uh, Pro uh proclus talks about how in doing math you well there's one level at which you can generate hypotheses as acts so like generate axioms hypothetically and there you're you're not like using intellect but he says there's a deeper level um where you intuit the necessity of these axioms and obviously you can't use mathematical reasoning to be able to intuit the necessity of a mathematical axiom because I mean, all mathematical processes are done on the basis of some like axiom. You can't use an algorithm to generate the basis of that al algorithm. Mm -hmm. So there has right. to be something more direct, intuitive and unprocedural that allows these uh, mental processes. So that's kind of the, I accept that logical argument for the necessity of like a super dialogical or uh, dialectical, uh, what's the best word for this? <laughs> Dianoetic is the best term. There's something beyond dianoetic discursive thought there has right. to be and that that's where we find this notion of uh, of intellectual intuition and the way in which you intellectually intuit a form i mean plato describes metaphorically in the phaedrus at, after this basically mystical ascent of the soul through the realms of being and until mm -hmm. you like touch beauty itself and he describes it as a touch right like a direct contact not like a, right. a distant right. apprehension um but yeah, it's, I think in the dialogues, like that's kind of what Plato is leading us to is the, like we question the nature of justice over 10 books in the Republic. You know, we take forever 
to try to circle around this notion and see all the problems with every particular uh, discursive definition we arrive at. Any like taxonomic definition ends up being slightly inadequate. And the, I mean, after the process is what's meant to like trigger this intellectual intuition in, uh, in us of the essence of this thing. So that's how we would know the forms. So it's very, in, it's an indirect process, but we do have intellectual access to them. And then beyond that, we can infer, given what we know intellectually of the forms, we can infer what right. their paradigms must be like, right. because obviously right. they're made in the image of, of the one and everything above that. So it, so anyway, the multiplicity in the one uh, can't be a numerical multiplicity because num uh, numerical multiplicity comes beneath the intellectual realm. It's inherent to the realm of soul, basically. It's in the mathematicals. It has to be beyond the number of the forms. But Iamblichus calls like being itself the chief among the second hypostasis, the kind of uh, usia, um first among the forms, he defines that as number itself, but a super mathematical number. So it like, cause we can talk about a number of the forms, but it's not like there's the first form, second form, third form, right. there's some kind of multiplicity, but it's, it's beyond what we can deal with dianoetically. Um, and then it, beyond that, there is like a multitude and a, a limiting aspect in the henads um and then beyond that there's the monad principle of limitation and indefinite dyad principle of energy and multiplication and obviously beyond that there is the seed of both of those in the one and so that's the sense in which there is a unity and a multiplicity but it's a, a multiplicity and a unity both that are totally beyond certainly beyond any definition that we could rationally come to it's beyond sure. even intellectual it's yeah something that has to be very loosely inferred sure um okay well i i have one more question um and it's uh about what you're talking about uh with the forms and like the intellectual uh knowledge of, of the forms um one, one th i was just wondering like is there any way you could um, like using what you know from Plato and your own personal philosophy, is there any way you could describe this even by analogy to the way you would, you would, um, the, the way we would have an intellectual knowledge of the forms? Because uh, for us, um, we can, there's like, uh, and, and I'm glad you clarified this because I think a lot of times Orthodox people critique critique the platonic view of the intellect and thinking that we're using the intellect in the same way that someone like this like the scholastics did that you guys are using it in the same way that the intellect is just like the ability to think about concepts and like be a rational mm -hmm. being but yeah. um there's clearly something above that and there are parallels there with orthodoxy because with orthodoxy we have uh the noose the heart the the heart is like the spiritual center of a person and noose I think is the greek term that i'm that intellect is oh. translated from oh okay wow yeah so there has <laughs> there has to be an influence there um and and i think news came up later in orthodox theology so like i'm pretty we probably took it from platonism like we we're probably inspired by that um i may be wrong there but uh that makes most sense uh so the news is like different from the intellect like uh, like the way we would use intellect is like rational knowledge uh rationality. that's dianoia dianoia okay course. okay sure and so yeah yeah so there's parallel concepts here and then the noose is where we encounter god and we make this spiritual in ascent in the heart because the heart is the center of the person it's like it's almost like who you are because your your knowledge like your rational thinking that is not you like you are thinking it but who you are as a person isn't located in your intellect. It's located in the heart. So the reason why the heart is the spiritual center of the person, how we, um, how we uh, move towards God, why like there's this notion of like retreating into the depths of your heart, moving away from the distractions of the, 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 the fallen world and the world uh, in, in time is because here at the center of our personhood is where we can have a personal encounter with God. So even though we can't describe it, using um like we can't circumscribe what it's like like what the immediacy of a relationship a personal relationship with god is um conceptually the way you can kind of think about it is like a personal relationship with another person it has to do with this irreducible like 
like it's irreducible because like you are the one doing it. It has, it, it's you do it. So you couldn't step outside of yourself and make some abstraction and be like, oh, this is what was occurring. Like, mm -hmm. and, and fully circumscribe it because it's like you doing it. So you meet God, um, you meet God, uh, like heart to heart, person to person. This is how you have the experience of God. So what that would be the way we would describe it. Um, and I, I think it does make sense within the system. So, but how yeah. would you, like, even if it kind of is based on like amb amb uh, amb uh, ambiguous terms for you, like what would the, how would you describe the the intellect's apprehension of the forms? Like how, like, it, are is there any analogy you could make uh, in with like rational knowledge, for example, or any, or perception even? Because for us, it's like, we see God, like there's this, like, there's like an analogy between actually seeing like the rays of the sun and then actually seeing God through the personal encounter with him. Like that's an analogy. Um, is, is there any similar analogies for the platonic view of seeing the forms, knowing the forms? Well, yeah, I mean, and literally it's the sun too in the Republic. Right. Yeah, it's a cave. The cave. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, the term noose is what we're using for intellect. And that is the summit of our soul. And that is where we make contact with, mm -hmm. you know, the realm of forms itself. Mm -hmm. uh, most Neoplatonists take a an even more indirect relationship with the forms in the sense that like they wouldn't even use the language, ironically, that Plato uses of actually making contact with the forms themselves. I kind of think you can make contact with the forms themselves, but most Neoplatonists say we have the koinai anoiai in our mind, which are images of the forms. Yeah. So, so have, just just yeah. interrupt. Yeah, I totally forgot my like the question I wanted to ask you is how Sorry. like I think it makes sense that you could um what's the term you use like make contact with a personal god right like mm -hmm. person to person. I I don't see how you could make contact with the forms like how how does that occur well because they are there in the hyparxis of your personal intellect but that's kind of getting at this distinction that i was just saying like proclus seems to say that we have the koinai annoyai the images of the forms in our mind and we can know those more perfectly by dialectical methods and all of that. And that's what we're doing um, in like it, the whole process of philosophy is trying to like clarify those in a sense. And yet, like he seems to indicate more of this kind of mystical union uh, mm -hmm. with with uh, higher realities in any case. I think it's maybe because Proclus like emphasized the gods more than like the importance of making contact with the forms themselves probably just to like emphasize like this isn't a, a solely intellectual thing there is mm -hmm. that higher uh mm -hmm. unific henatic uh realm that we really ought to be aiming at i suppose um but in any case like the summit of our intellect converges with the second hypostasis itself um, it converges with the realm of forms themselves. So if you ascend to your summit simultaneously, you are like passing through the realm of forms. And if you continued even further, of course, in my opinion, as more of a non-dualist, you would eventually get back to the one. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, that is all the questions I have for you. Uh, I really like this conversation because I think we did a good job of like explaining the differences and the similarities because i was surprised by the amount of similarities that we had there uh i i think like oh i guess one last question for you is do you think your interpretation of plato is sort of the orthodox view because i know with like i kind of come from a hegelian background and literally every single other hegelian you meet has another perspective on hegel like mm -hmm. spirit <laughs> spirit man differs from uh zizek and then zizek differs from another guy and like there's so many different interpretations so uh do you think with plato it's like pretty cut and dry what he believes or do you are you like just no. following the traditional or no no yeah <laughs> well, I'm... do you think that you are interpreting plato more faithfully than like or as faithfully as you um like do you think like you have any differences with plato himself or do you think you're actually just faithfully following his his teachings uh well i i don't actually um necessarily uh like 
conform a hundred percent to what I think Plato thought. I also mm-hmm. don't claim to fully understand what Plato thought. Sure. Plato makes arguments against a a many worlds cosmology. And I accept the many worlds cosmology. Now, is that some kind of noble lie that it's better for us to believe in simply one world? I it's it's hard to tell. There are very, you know a small number of kind of doctrinal differences that I would have with what I think Plato is saying. But as far as like interpreting Plato, I f- try to follow Proclus more than anyone else. Among Neoplatonists, I think Proclus is the closest to the truth. Um, and that's based on his writing style. It's based on the clarity of his arguments. Um, later writers like uh, Damascius tries to kind of go beyond Proclus in various ways, but he also has a, like a very temperamental style of writing. Kind of reminds me of like Nietzsche, the way he writes sometimes, where he starts like complaining about personalities. And it's like, this doesn't right. look like a right. real philosophical disposition. Um, and Proclus gives like comprehensive textual arguments from Plato himself, why that the interpretation interpretation he gives, uh, it should be considered authentic. Mm-hmm. So I think Proclus is the greatest interpreter of, Pro, of uh, Plato throughout all history in terms of like the modern schools of Platonism, um, like there's the Tubingen school, which is relatively mainstream, which is basically like Neoplatonists were right. And when I read most of the translators of these Neoplatonic works, they all tend to agree with the idea that like Proclus basically defines Neoplatonism. He was the most authoritative voice and everyone else is kind of either pre procline um, and like hasn't fully systematized it yet, or they like basically conform to to his views. Um, so that's kind of my my school of thought on it. Pro, I wouldn't defer, uh, or I'd, rather, I wouldn't differ from Proclus on interpretation of Plato himself, just out of like humility. Uh, at this point in time, I, I still haven't mm-hmm. finished all of Proclus's writing because he's extremely voluminous and dense and difficult, right. and. Um, so I don't know. I think, you know, basically I'm not going to disagree with whatever Proclus says at this point. Fair enough. Okay. Well, uh, yeah. So that was a great conversation. Thank you for coming on. Uh, anything you want to just tell people about, I know, for example, the uh, understanding Plato channel, I'll uh, put a link to that in the description. Uh, that's a great channel. If like, yeah. So for anyone who wants to learn about Plato and learn like the basics of Plato. And then I know even in your, uh, your reading groups, they're, they're still open to anyone who, who wants yeah. to join. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, if you want to get even deeper into the text with, uh, with Eric and with, uh, other people, there's the, the reading group. And, uh, is, is that pretty much all you're doing? The reading group and the understanding Plato channel? Yeah, I mean, I have my main channel still, yeah, and I yeah, just post whatever I want to say on there. Um, like, why to join a cult? Oh, yeah, that was my last video. I thought <laughs> yeah. it was a good title. Uh, uh, I mean, if you think about it, isn't the cult kind of the traditional lifestyle as far as, like, going back in history? Yeah. That's, yeah, yeah that's just the way it's always been. So you can't be a traditionalist unless you're pro-cult. <laughs> that's my perspective. Sure. Um yeah, yeah, I have a few different reading groups. So we do the Platonic Dialogues, we do the Neoplatonists. In another one, we do Aristotle's Organon. At the moment, we're finishing up Prior Analytics. Thank God, because that is the most miserable text I've ever read in my life. And then um, we have another group on Galileo, actually. So it's not like exclusively uh, Platonism, but it, it's kind of in that line. Um, and more like modern, early modern philosophers were influenced by Platonism and Aristotelian than uh, Aristotelianism than we tend to think. Um, and also, there's more like unity between Plato and Aristotle than many people suspect. But right. uh, yeah, so it's kind of a broad like looking at intellectual history through the lens of Platonism, really. But that's what we got going on. Cool. Okay. Well, uh, thanks for coming on again, and uh, to anyone watching. Subscribe, subscribe to Airval and Understanding Plato, and uh, join the Telus Bound Discord. Cause, uh, yeah, if you want to join a cult, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But, uh, we're we uh, yeah, we got some great conversation. We we have a actually this is I'm, I was gonna say we have a voice chat tonight, but this isn't going up until Wednesday. But, uh, yeah, we do uh, voice chats and stuff. So uh, join us there. But yeah, Eric, thank you. Thank you, Trey. It was fun.